you know, for you, your next step is like, you gotta simplify the game. And you gotta have different options. Yeah. Pull up jump shot has gotta be in your game. Yeah. You got to. Who you meeting at the rim now? What you mean? When you get to the next level. Oh, what players? Dude. What type of players? Like oh. athletic dudes that's gonna knock you off your spot, gonna meet you in, at the dots, at the uh, charge circle, so you might not be able to take off. So you gotta oh. pull up. Simplify. Yeah. Because as time goes on, you don't want to use your athleticism at the end of the game to close it. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So you got you to gotta be looking at the close the game. You know what I mean? Yeah. At that age, we young, we spy, and we got so much energy, but you got to start playing chess out there. Yeah, that's exactly what my dad said. We can become the same thing. You know what I mean? Because it's, it's going to be a time where you have to survey the floor because you're so much better than everybody in the game slowing down. Like, you don't want to live with that right there. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It's fun and it's good. It's like cool, but you don't want to live with it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that pull up J, three pointer, catch and shoot, climb off the ball, slash into the rim. That's gonna conserve your energy. So now in the fourth when it's time to go, you gotta know what it is. <laughs> it's your time then. So keep working, bro. I love it. I'm gonna keep following. Appreciate that. I always say this, man. I always say that you can really tell what a player's value is and what they can do and what their weaknesses and strengths are. If you just truly just watch them and them alone for a couple games. Now, I challenge you guys to do this with players. If you're trying to see how you can beat them, see how you can get past them. It's just watch them and zone in on them and only them for the whole game. And watch when they get beat. Watch how they get lost. Just that kind of stuff. And watch how they get, get to their buckets too. Watch how they affect the game. Uh, first things first, let me start off by saying that I've been a believer in Giannis from the moment that he got drafted. Uh, my older brother and myself, we both believe that he'll become a great <clears throat> all-around player. And he'll be a force for the years to come. Uh, yet I noticed that whenever anybody who is an analyst or who likes basketball critiques a player in any way, shape, or form, uh, you get called a hater. Or better yet, if you give him a compliment and that player's haters, they're going to call you a fill-in-the-blank sexual. I just think that, <laughs> think that crap is funny, man. Uh, let's just clear the air on that right now. This video is simply just to show people the best game plan that I could come up with if I'm an opposing coach when dealing with Giannis and the Bucks in a game. Now, I've watched every game of the regular season that the Bucks lost to a playoff team. Uh, also, you know, other teams as well, but mainly the playoff teams to make this video to see what did slow him down, as well as some more tape, with specifically the Boston Celtics. So stay tuned. Uh, praise up to the most high. Let's get it. In order to understand how the Bucks can be beaten, let's first look at how Giannis should be played if you want to have a shot at stopping him. Now, the key is to wear down the physical Greek freak throughout the game offensively and defensively. Uh, to start off with defense, Giannis, he currently finishes with a, about a 70% average, uh, give or take, uh, slightly above that actually, in the paint. And we know that once he's within three feet, it's basically a bucket. So how do you keep him from getting to the bucket? Now, you can try and force him left because he loves to get to his right hand uh, or go right even when starting off left and will usually spin right or pull up for a jumper at the top of the key if he's forced left. But that's just not good enough to stop a player of his caliber. You want to do a few things, uh, one of a few things defensively if you want to try and keep Giannis at bay. Uh, you either use physical forwards to wall him out of the paint or you attempt to put a guard on him on the perimeter that can rip him early because he usually likes to start from the top. From a defensive standpoint, you want Giannis to become a lone show for the Bucks. You want him to take everyone else out of the game. Basically, everyone's going to stay man to man outside of the paint. Giannis is a mid 30s shooter from the floor. All right. You give him his left or force him to pick up his dribble early. Timely charge attempts outside the paint are important as well. The refs won't call charge if he's posting you up down low. That is not going to do it. I've seen it countless times. They're not going to call it. Guys like Chris Middleton are more important to keep from getting touches because those are where your three balls are coming from. To do this, you've got to play man to man. Nobody helps, period. If you get beaten, you get beaten. Too much switching on a team like this, this unloaded uh, in terms of unselfishness, man. Look, man, this leads to great ball movement uh, and easy looks from downtown. This is the best thing you can do for a player like Giannis who cannot space the floor and needs to operate in the paint. You may get into operating the paint, not only a living hell, but you cut off the air around him. You cut off milk. That's basically his bailout when he can't get what, he's, what he wants in the paint is that three-point look. But you can cut off Milwaukee's main weapon, which is their three-point shooting, very easily if everyone stays home. Much of their offense stems from Milwaukee getting up three-point looks off of Giannis' penetration and defenders helping. The Bucks put up about 
Uh, they're number two in the league in three pointers attempted and number two in three pointers made. So they get up a lot of threes, uh, but they only rank 15th in actual percentage, which shows you uh, that they're shot jacking. All right. Now, what does this tell you? This also tells you something about the Houston Rockets as well, who are very similar. And we can look at what the Rockets, what happened to the Rockets last year when the three ball wasn't falling. Uh, the Rockets, they were what? Number one in three pointers made and number one in three pointers attempted while only being 12th in three point percentage this year. So we can see those two teams are very similar. Uh, their center, Brooke Lopez, shoots about six out of his nine field goal attempts from downtown. So trust me, Milwaukee needs that three ball more than a lot of other teams do. Um, when that three ball isn't falling, Basically, the goal of that defensive plan is to force Giannis to become Wilt Chamberlain and beat you all by himself, which is a lot of pressure to place on one player. It's a lot of pressure. This is important because the three will not be so open during the playoffs against the team the way that it is during the regular season where guys are so tired and won't be closing out with any urgency or running anyone off the line. So now that we've seen how to disengage his teammates from the game while putting all of the pressure on him to succeed and carry the team on his back, here's where you want to get the bucks if you're an offensive team. Uh, you want to, from an offensive standpoint, I mean, you want to wear Giannis out over the course of the game by including him in your attacking. Uh, oftentimes, the Bucks they use the uh, Cavs uh, game plan where LeBron was getting rested a lot by Ty Lue. You can see that last year. The Bucks they rest Giannis by placing him on a wing. Who's sitting in the corner for a corner three? Uh, that way he can he doesn't he can just help and he doesn't really have to play or guard any primary ball handling scores from the top and shuffle his feet and move laterally. Uh, what you want to do is you want to call for a pick and pop using Horford, Morris, or Tatum, and keep them up top so that if Giannis stays on Irving or Brown, he has to play them honest on the wing, or uh, including Scary Terry, he has to play them honest on the wing. He's going to get tired of covering them continuously. Uh, he doesn't have great lateral movement. He's long, but he's not quick. There's a difference. He's long, but he's not quick. He doesn't have uh, that lateral movement to be able to shuffle and keep up with those guys, nor do we really expect him to. But this is going to put a lot of pressure on him as well because he likes to rest on defense and he usually goes up for shot blocks. And that's really it. He doesn't like to, you know, rotate on defense too well. And this is going to have him playing him honest and he's going to have to stay out of the paint and the guard. <laughs> he's going to have to guard whoever the pop man is outside because they'll have to keep him honest if he tries to help by kicking to an easy three. Now, this continuous drawing out of Giannis will force him to not just sit back on defense and rest, but have to play basically a perfect series versus a Boston team with three very good wings who can pass, dribble, and shoot on the wing once drawn out, uh, or have to deal with Marcus Morris or Horford on the outside and the inside when they're posting him up and shooting from outside. And, in, you know, while potentially getting beaten off the dribble every time by Rosier or Irving. Now, Giannis who also averages about three fouls per game. Uh, so this will force him to lay off his aggression because he won't be able to contest shots with the same vigor, uh, nor will he be able to blindly throw his weight around uh, on offense against a smart team who knows when to sell a flop. One of the best ways that we can see why this game plan works against the Bucks is by juxtaposing the two series last year between the Celtics and the Bucks and the Celtics and the Cavs. Now, in the series versus the Bucks, the Celtics were missing not only Kyrie Irving and Gordon Hayward, but also Marcus Smart for a game or two, while Jalen Brown missed most of Game 7 after going down with injury. Uh, so, yes, one could make the argument that the Bucks were not as good as they are now, uh, but they should have been able to beat the Celtics last year. And here's how they got beaten in comparison to the Cavs, who did not behind a much more refined player in LeBron James. Now, let's look at how the Celtics were able to beat the Bucks. They would not let Giannis rest on defense if they could. They utilize all wings and forwards to attack him on offense, and they would not let him get a running start at the rim. Now, because Giannis is not a premier post-fade scorer or mid-range jump shooter and beyond, nor is he a slick passer out of the double team, he isn't able to dissect the defense like a LeBron James can. Uh, just look at how differently they have to play LeBron and how much easier his job becomes. They at times will go above screens for him, uh, and that gives him the ability to slip past and hit the mid-range J or drive to the basket where he isn't a shabby finisher himself, or a kick to a wide open shooter. Uh, just look at this streak to the rim by Bron. Uh, he's going to run a give and go where he easily gets to the rim because Marcus Morris has to play him above the three point line. As I said before, LBJ has amazing court vision and cannot be doubled in the post, which allows him to dominate scoring wise or slip a pass to K Love if you dare double him. Now, Giannis is not as willing of a passer, nor does he have that vision. Uh, this, along with the lack of his lack of being able to score from the outside, uh, it wouldn't matter if Giannis played center, really. I mean, a lot of people say that all of his scoring from the outside isn't necessary because he's a center or he's a power forward. Uh, the reason that this is important is because he likes to start off outside. It's not it's not like he starts off on the block. He likes to start off from outside uh, and get a running start. Uh, you know, he likes to build up ahead of steam before driving in. And that basically turns him into a guard if he's starting outside. 
I made this game plan against the Bucks primarily to show that it doesn't take a coaching genius like Brad Stevens to see that the Celtics, barring catastrophic injury, will most likely beat the Bucks. Uh, in my opinion, the Celtics have most likely already figured out a way to minimize the deep ball threat of Milwaukee and will most likely finish them in six games. I don't believe that the finally figured out win rotation of Brown, Tatum, and Hayward will be as contained as Giannis's supporting cast. Uh, most of that cast needs to be spoon fed their scoring touches and I believe that if you put the pressure on Giannis to carry them past a team as loaded mentally as the Celtics that he will not be able to deliver. Uh, and that's no slight against him, but do we really do we really think that on the fly Mike Budenholzer, the same Mike Budenholzer who could not get a game versus LeBron and the Cavs uh, in 2015 where they did not have K-Love, uh, do we really think that he'll be able to handle crisis better than Brad Stevens? Do you trust Eric Bledsoe to hold Kyrie down when he struggled with Terry Rozier last year? Will Giannis have enough in the tank to switch on Brown, Tatum, Hayward, Irving, Horford, and Morris while putting up at least 28 to 30 plus points per game? Now, barring catastrophic injury, I believe the Bucks will be making an early exit in the playoffs uh, to a worthy opponent in Boston. Uh, let me know your thoughts. You believe in the Bucks? Or do you have the Celtics? Uh, drop your take down below for a chance to be featured in the next video. Now, you already know, never mad at me, but you mad at yourself for being an underachiever. Play the outro.